actually disliked the label feminist. She was an existentialist. And she was convinced that women needed to face an existential crisis. There was no excuse. They had to be responsible for their own freedom. In post-war Europe, there was a different kind, a new kind of emphasis on women. In Germany, it was termed the hour of the woman because the women of the rubble would sort of would rebuild the cities, but this also became symbolic about women's strength and resilience to rebuild the country. Of course, women were the primary uh, aspect of the population in the post-war, particularly in Germany. Men were absent, they'd either been killed or they were still in um, POWs. POWs. And this was even more true in the Soviet Union. So women were in the workforce during the war and in the post-war years, whether it's something they desired or not. And this resulted in very real political and social gains for women. In Western countries, for instance, the important contribution of working women meant that it made it impossible in the post-war years, for the most part, to deny half of the population the right to vote. So in the countries that hadn't already given women the right to vote, women received this after the war in France, in Italy, Belgium, and Portugal. Now, moving on to today's theme, the idea of forgetting and remembering leads nicely into our topic. The Cold War, this is arguably the most important development that defined post-war Europe and the world for decades to come. So today we're going to talk about Europe, the Cold War in Europe, and then on Thursday we'll move into the Cold War world and talk about decolonization. This lecture, you'll notice, is going to be primarily focused on the U.S. and the Soviet Union, and I've done this for a reason. First, because they were the new centers of power politically, economically, and militarily after the war, but also because the influence and power in Europe became a tug of war between the Soviet Union and the U.S. And I want to demonstrate how European history is global history. Of course, we've talked about this theme throughout the course. You see this very, very clearly in the Cold War that developed over and in Europe, eventually spreading to all continents. So I titled the lecture An Old and New Conflict because the Cold War and the political ideologies that placed a so-called iron curtain between the East and the West and threatened the world with nuclear war was certainly a dark legacy of the Second World War. This is in keeping with our theme, the nature of the war shape of possibilities for peace. Some of the aspects of continuity between the wartime and Cold War period were that Eastern and Central Europe were focal points. In some ways, the very same sites of persecution were utilized. For instance, concentration camps, were retooled for enemies of the new communist regime in East, in the East, in East Germany. And old Nazis were sometimes eager to be recruited and were recruited on either side, both the East and the West in the Cold War period. However, the Cold War was also a new conflict that allowed for new alliances, new alignments, and new enemies. Indeed, former enemies became bitter, bitter rivals and of course, former rivals, such as France and Germany, slowly formed new and lasting partnerships. So what do we mean of when we speak of the Cold War? It's certainly not a conventional war. It refers to the rivalry, first for European, and then for global influence between two political ideologies and ways of life. The main protagonists were the Soviet bloc, the ideology of communism, and a state-controlled economy. On the other side, there was the so-called free world, dominated by the United States, and eventually Western Europe, and built upon the ideals of liberal democracy and a free market capitalism. 
So it's important to recognize that the Cold War was fought on many fronts. Political, economic, cultural, also militarily. And it lasted from its wartime roots through to the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. Some suggest that when explaining the Cold War, we also have to consider in what ways we might think about the conflict as a cold peace. An era of immense tension between rival powers, but nonetheless created, at least in Europe, a fragile balance that perhaps ironically largely preserved the peace of the Western world. But we also have to remember that the Cold War expanded globally, and there were sites of armed conflict both in Europe and in other continents. Remarkably, however, the US and the Soviet Union never actually came to blows directly with one another, despite fighting in so-called proxy wars in states like Korea and Vietnam. The question becomes then, how did the vital wartime alliance between the Western allies fall apart so quickly and turn into the Cold War? First, the alliance between the Soviet Union and the allies was built around a common determination to see Hitler defeated, not around common political ideals or goals. Problems arose already during the war. Stalin had desperately, desperately urged his allies for, to open a second front in Northwest Europe to take pressure off the Soviets fighting in the East. We know from our lectures on the war, this didn't happen until June 1944 by which time the Soviet Union had been fighting for three years. So the sacrifices of the USSR were staggering when compared to the sacrifices of the United States. In fact, the total American casualties were only 2% of the total casualties of the Soviet Union. And of course, the role of the Soviet Union was vital to winning World War II. So Stalin felt that he would have a substantial hand in deciding the form that post-war Europe would take, and basically what would happen to Germany and Germany's allies in defeat. By the end of 1943, it was already very clear that the Soviets would liberate Eastern Europe, and that the Soviets and Western allies would finally meet up in Germany. So the primary question for Roosevelt and for Churchill was what would happen to the territories of Eastern and Central Europe that were or would soon be under Soviet control. This included Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, the Balkans, and what would happen to Germany itself. And this map shows you Europe in 1945, of course, the shading of red represents the areas held by the Soviet Union. And now Stalin indicated that he considered these territories to be within his so-called sphere of influence. Territories that he would, he insisted, be a part of the Soviet bloc to provide sort of a buffer for the Soviet Union. They were to protect the Soviet Union from perhaps future Western aggression. And here we might question whether some of the legacies of World War I come into play here. You'll recall the US and British forces supported forces in the Civil War who had been fighting against the Bolsheviks. There's also a good map in Merriman, probably a more detailed map, to show you the territories occupied by the Red Army at the war's end. So what was developing was hardly the vision of post-war Europe that Roosevelt and Churchill had in mind. They believed in the idea of national self-determination. So the populations of each state would determine their future course. Three conferences took place to discuss the fate of post-war Europe. The first was in Tehran in November 1943, again between Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill. The second was in Yalta in February 1945. And even at this stage, 
there were clear differences over the shape of the post-war era and the clearly developing spheres of influence. Soviets in the East, Western allies in the West. But despite these early tensions, the allies were still working together. The war still needed to be won. So in the last phases, you see cooperation and conflict between the Soviet Union, Britain, and the United States. The final conference was the Potsdam Conference, and it took place in July 1945. Now at this stage, from the British and the American perspective, Stalin was violating early Allied agreements by installing communist governments in places like Poland and Romania without allowing free elections, as he had promised. He was taking over Eastern Europe, creating so-called puppet states that would be loyal to his rule. On the other hand, from the Russian perspective, the Americans would now announce that they would no longer extend loans to the Soviets for reconstruction. This is something that they had promised earlier to the Soviet Union. In the Soviets' view, this indicated that the United States planned to keep the Soviet Union weak. So in July 1945, there are suspicions on each side that felt the other had sort of tricked them during the war. Now, tensions were quite high at Potsdam. The old wartime camaraderie was gone. If you notice, Churchill, no longer in power, Clement Attlee, attended as Britain's Prime Minister, and Roosevelt, who had always sort of had a certain sympathy for Stalin's position, um, had passed away in April and um, was succeeded by his relatively inexperienced uh, Vice President, Harry Truman. And Harry Truman took a harder line with the Soviet Union. An important part of Truman's harder line was that while the meetings at Potsdam were underway, 7,000 miles away in the Mexican desert, the US were successfully exploding the world's first atomic bomb. Now, if you're interested in the nuclear developments of the Cold War, it's not something I'm going to focus on, but Merriman covers it very well in your text. What I will stress is that now the Americans felt confident that they no longer needed the Soviet Union to help them win the war in the Pacific that was still waging against Japan. U.S. Secretary of War, Henry Stinson, put it, quote, the bomb was America's royal flush. This is a political cartoon that appeared in this time period about the negotiations at Potsdam given the uh, U.S. Um, atomic capabilities. Now the other big question at Potsdam was what was going to happen to Germany. The Americans believed that the economic recovery and future prosperity of both post-war Europe and importantly, the United States, depended on the creation of an economically vibrant Germany. For the Soviets, however, this would amount to giving Germany over to capitalism. In addition, the Soviets and the Western allies disagreed on war reparations. Now, war reparations is something that Stalin pushed for and wanted because his country had suffered so much during the war at the hands of the Germans. But the Western Allies feared that his intent was to drain occupied Germany of its resources, to pay for the recovery of the Soviet Union, and that doing so would cripple rather than rebuild the German economy. They weren't really able to come to any solid agreement so, in the end, Stalin insisted upon reparations, and he ended up simply seizing things from the German zone, or from his zone in Germany. We see pictures from the post-war period of huge trains just bringing um, whole factories from Germany back east. Ultimately, a compromise was reached at Potsdam, but it wasn't one that made anyone happy. 
It did, however, allow Britain, France, or excuse me, Britain, the US, and the Soviet Union to maintain a sense of unity for the time being. The compromise was that they would divide Germany between them. The Americans, British and French, would control Western Germany. That's on your map. Not at this stage, it isn't the Federal Republic of Germany, that comes in 1949, but this is the area that uh, they control. And the East, and the Soviets would control Eastern Germany and set up a, a, a sort of a create, a, create a pro Soviet communist regime that would be controlled largely from Moscow. Berlin, as we talked about last week, was similarly divided into four zones. Although the city itself is located in the Soviet zone. Now at this stage in Potsdam, 1945, no party was thinking that Germany would remain divided for decades. Rather, both the US and the Soviet Union each hoped to sort of bring a unified Germany permanently under its own influence. This would allow them to hold more sway over the rest of Europe, given Germany's importance to the region, its location, its economic capabilities. So it's at this stage that we start to see the emergence of the Cold War. And months after the most devastating conflict in history, Europe, and as we'll soon see the, war, the world, was once again bitterly divided along stark ideological lines, and these would remain a source of conflict for decades. Both sides began to see the other as an enemy that was trying to expand its influence at all costs. Churchill delivered his famous Iron Curtain speech. Is there anyone who hasn't heard of the Iron Curtain speech? I didn't think so, yeah. His famous Iron Curtain speech in March 1946 in Missouri. This is a political cartoon that was depicting Stalin trying to grab uh, what he could of Europe. In his speech, Churchill stated, quote, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. That line, behind that line, lie all the capitals of the ancient states of Central and Eastern Europe. Warsaw, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest, Bucharest and Sofia. All of these famous cities and the populations around them lie in the Soviet sphere and are all subject in one form or another, not only to Soviet influence, but to a very high and increasing measure of control from Moscow. Now Stalin's response was equally, if not more, polemic. Stalin stated, quote, in substance, Mr. Churchill now stands in the position of a firebrand of war. And Mr. Churchill is not alone here. He has friends not only in England, but also in the United States of America. In this respect, one is remarkably reminded of Hitler and his friends. Hitler began to set war loose by announcing his racial theory, declaring that only people speaking the German language represent a fully valuable nation. Mr. Churchill begins to set war loose also by a racial theory, maintaining that only nations speaking the English language are fully valuable nations, called upon to decide the destinies of the entire world. The German racial theory brought Hitler and his friends to the conclusion that the Germans, as the only fully valuable nation, must rule over other nations. The English racial theory leads Mr. Churchill and his friends to the conclusion that nations speaking the English language, being the only fully valuable nations, should rule over the remaining nations of the world. So here you see, in concrete terms, the rhetoric of Nazism being applied to a former ally. So how did the hostile powers deal with these new tensions? The US response was a policy of containment. Given the fact that it defined and affected it defined U.S. policy towards Europe and affected Europe for the next four decades, it has to be considered one of the most controversial 
and important ideas of the 20th century. The sort of belief behind containment was that Soviet hostility to the West was inevitable and it was permanent. So there was no point in trying to negotiate or accommodate the Soviets. So the U.S. should try to halt the spread of Soviet